Um, well, we, I guess we've all been sort of learning this um, at home practice and, and I actually think it's really good for people uh, that that's, could be a, another one of the positive outgrowths or outcomes of, uh, of this terribly difficult time that uh, people have had to, you know, support their own practice. And of course, you know, I'm here, but um, you're, you're at home or, or somewhere on your own, presumably. And, um, you know, so, so you don't get to have that like group of people around you kind of, we could say supporting you or, or kind of helping you to just be committed to, to the practice as you sit and committed to sort of being still and all that. But it, it really, it really helps us when we can become more independent in our practice and we're not dependent on going to a class or being with other people. So I hope that people will use that uh, kind of training, if you will, uh, this year to, to, you know, develop that kind of more sense of independence and, and uh, capacity to, um, you know, be self, uh, self, uh, what's the term? <laughs> self-driven, self-motivated, self-something. Uh, or maybe I should say not self, but then it gets confusing. So uh, in any case, just uh, finding your meditation posture. And hopefully that's something that you work with on a regular basis. You know, finding just the way we hold our bodies is such a kind of, uh, sometimes I think overlooked uh, or at least under valued and element of our meditation. And so taking some time just to see how, how you're holding your body. And we want to sit quite still if possible. We want to be upright if possible. Not if it's, you know, physically challenging or, you know, disruptive. I mean, we want to sit in a way that's balanced so that there's a kind of sense of alignment and centeredness. You can close your eyes or just lower your gaze. And as you do so, then seeing if your body feels grounded. Simply coming into a balanced, comfortable posture can really already kind of help us to settle. You know, if you've been busy or out and about or stressing in some way, to just have a sense of arriving and of everything settling in the body and in the mind. And that arriving itself can really help us to be more present, to let go and eat 
disturbances and agitation. There's nowhere to go, nothing to accomplish right now. Just to hang out and be quiet. This in itself can be very healing. We don't give ourselves enough quiet time, most of us. And then noticing what what doesn't want to be let go of, what what lingers even as you try to settle. But not to judge that or try to fix that. Rather really to open and allow whatever's there emotionally or energetically or in your nervous system, you know, what are you feeling? And then you can see if you can connect the breath with that feeling. So let the breath go to the places in the body that hold any kind of stress or agitation, any could be other moods, energies. And so the breath, the breath kind of opens up the body. It's one of the ways we can use the breath, not to force anything, but just a sense of that inhalation opening the chest and a sense of giving space for whatever's there. Again, not pushing it away, trying to fix it, but by giving it space, there can be a, a kind of acceptance that comes even with the difficult or unpleasant feelings. And if the mind continues to generate thoughts, when that takes you away from the breath and from the body, to just acknowledge that and gently come back. Most of the time we don't have a lot of control over our thoughts. They seem to have their own sort of life. You know, if we examine them, we often can see where they're coming from, that some worry or plan or something that's been 
mulling over in our mind shows up when we sit down to meditate. Or perhaps we're even thinking about meditation, trying to figure out if we're doing it right or how to change what's happening. Even these are just, just thoughts to be seen, to be acknowledged. There's often this tendency to judge ourselves, judge our meditation, or kind of try to rate how we're doing. It always comes with this kind of critical thinking, this self-criticism. The spirit of mindfulness is actually kindness, not judgment. So we try to see if we can point our minds to a more gentle response. Even when we see those negative thoughts to come up to not to even judge them, but, but to see the suffering. And see if you can be kind even to the self-criticism. Hold it. We understand that some part of us is trying to be a better person. But our minds don't sort of see that that attitude of judgment is is not helping. So it's not so much that we think about all this, try to think nice thoughts. It's more like a kind of felt, a felt experience, like a softening. It's like when you hold a baby in your arms, it's just naturally gentle. You don't have to think about it. But there's a way in which we try to hold ourselves in that way, in this gentle, kind way.
All right. Well. That's just long enough to just start to fall asleep. And then uh, just stayed, just stayed awake there. Um, okay, kitties. Um, as I said, um, step seven in, in the last section, which for some reason is called humbly humbled. I don't know who came up with some of these things. I, I, I guess I thought I was being funny or something. I don't know. It's so long ago, it's like a different lifetime when I wrote some of these things. Um, I'm going to bring in um, a sutta uh, tonight, maybe a couple things. But just to start by, um, if you're if you're following along at home, I'm on page 176 of One Breath at a Time. Uh, if there's one thing that will humble anyone, it's sitting down and trying to control the mind, trying to hold our attention to the breath or any other object. There are different responses people have to this experience. One friend signed up for a six week introductory meditation class, went for two weeks and said, I can't do it. My mind just won't stay still. As far as I know, she never tried meditation again. Other people dig in their heels, putting in long hours of practice, determined to take control. Ultimately though, even the most determined practitioner will find that effort alone is not enough to still the mind. So I want to, when I read that this morning, when I was thinking about the class, it reminded me of a sutta and I'm going to get it out right now before I move on because the next section is a little diff different. So uh, this is just a, a little book <laughs> called the, uh, Samyutta Nikaya or the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, some uh, 1600 pages of them. Um, and, and you know, I, I remember finding this sutta, uh, it was not long after I got this book and it, it's so, such a big, you know, book and I haven't, you know, read, you know, probably a 10th of it. Um, but uh, I was teaching a retreat and I just, uh, I guess I took it with me to the retreat and I just was like, well, let me look at the first sutta. <laughs> and it's just a great sutta. So, and this is, I'll say this is um, the connected discourses that this book is, that what it is is, um, there's a lot of sort of shorter discourses that are all on the same same theme or like related in some way. So this first section is what's called the Devata Samyutta. And that that essentially means the discourses where the Buddha is talking to angels. <laughs> so if you thought that Buddhism was like, you know, didn't have anything magical in it, uh, I mean, I call them angels. They call they call them devas in the suttas, but I think the the kind of Western equivalent is angels. They they're like beings that are, uh, you know, living in a different realm from humans, in a more pleasant realm, but they're still not enlightened. So they come to the Buddha to ask him questions. So it's very common you'll see in the suttas that, like, sometimes there's even one sutta where the Buddha's like. Would, would, would everybody like sit down because the the devas are getting angry because they can't see me you're blocking their view from the it's like down in front you know and uh, you know as as many of the suttas begin it starts with the phrase thus have i heard which is that was the voice of of ananda who was the buddha's attendant who uh who recited many of these after the Buddha died. He sort of memorized them when the Buddha spoke. And, uh, and then it tells us where the Buddha was. He was in a place where he spent many, many uh, of the retreats. Um, it's, uh, he was at Sabati in Jeta's Grove, Anattapindigas Park. So there's a long story behind that park, but we'll pass that tonight. So then it says, then when the night had advanced, a certain devata of stunning beauty 
illuminating the entire Jetas Grove, approached the Blessed One. Having approached, he paid homage to the Blessed One, stood to one side and said to him, how did, dear sir, did you cross the flood? And so this means essentially, how did you become enlightened? What did you do? And the Buddha says, by not halting, friend, and by not straining, I crossed the flood. But how is it, dear sir, that by not halting and by not straining, you crossed the flood? When I came to a standstill, friend, then I sank. But when I struggled, then I got swept away. It is in this way, friend, that by not halting and by not straining, I crossed the flood. So this is a, a teaching on right effort. You know, how do you, what do you do? How do you, how do you meditate? You know, in this case, I mean, it's talking, you know, in lofty terms, how do you become enlightened? But it's, it's the same question in our meditation. And as I was describing in this, that first paragraph of this section of One Breath at a Time, like some people halt, right? You, you take a class and you feel like you can't do it, so you just quit. So, you know, if, as the Buddha says, when I came to a standstill, when I halted, then I sank, right? Uh, you know, the, so this is the flood or the, you know, the, the river that we're trying to cross. You know, and if you don't, if you just fall in the water and don't do anything, you sink to the bottom. So uh, if we make no effort, nothing happens, right? But when I struggled, I got swept away. Like, I'm like, I'm going to fight. I'm going to, you know, it, it, it's like, uh, you know, trying too hard. Um, you know, and this is a very common experience too, where we're like, okay, I'm really going to meditate. I'm going to get this right. I'm going to pay attention to my breath for every single breath for the next 20 minutes. And then you're so tight that, you know, you just go off and, and the mind gets distracted just by all that energy. So it's, I, I love this teaching because it, it points to that kind of middle way of effort you know, that and and but it also it you know in a way um you know it's not saying it's very typical too of of the way the buddha taught which is he he tells you what he didn't do <laughs> right like this is like dharma 101 like everything is about letting go. And if I tell you what to do, you're gonna become attached to that. Instead, he says, don't halt, and don't strain. And essentially what he's saying is like, if you don't halt and you don't strain, see what happens. See what, the, can, you, can you find that place of not halting and not straining? As it's a very subtle place, it's a very subtle energetic place. And, you know, this is, why we have to meditate a lot to kind of learn what that is to, to find that little space. And it, and it's, you know, in kind of sports talk, we could talk about, about being in the flow or being in the zone. And that's what we're kind of trying to find that place. That's not straining, but, but we're not, not, do, you know, we're not doing nothing <laughs> or we're not, not <laughs> making effort. You know, there's an effort. You know, there's a, there's a passage in um, Suzuki Roshi's classic uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. That's on right effort. And he says that he, t he describes right effort, but again, in these kind of like hard to pin down terms. And he says, it's, but then he says, it's the secret of practice which I think is right. And, and, but I think that partly what he's saying there is that you can't tell somebody what it is. You know, it's kind of a secret, but it's, it's not a secret because people refuse to tell you, but it's a secret because only you can find it for yourself. 
You know, and when you do find it, when you find that balance, then it is like a discovery and, and, and a, you know, it's a sweet, it's like the sweet spot, you know, you find that. Now, it's not that we find it and then, okay, we've got it <laughs> and never going to lose it again. It's just that now we have a sense of what it is. And, and then we can sort of navigate our way back there. And, and sometimes we get there and sometimes we don't. Like, you know, most of the time, probably if you reflect on your own effort in your practice, probably most of the time you are either, uh, you know, struggling or halting. You know, you're either kind of like, oh, let me just let go. Oops, okay, too much letting go. Or you're like, let me make some more effort. Come on, let's do this. And you're, you're, the jaw is getting tense, and the shoulders are getting tense. You know, or you're like counting your breath. I'm gonna, I'm really good, you know, I'm really good at counting my breath. And then all of a sudden it's like all I'm doing is counting to 10. I'm not really meditating, I'm just counting <laughs> angrily, you know, or frustratedly. So I think it's this is just the the nature of the practice that that uh, place uh, of balance is uh, it's not always available, um, but it is important to kind of uh, at least find it and have a sense of it, and have a taste of it. So the. After that opening paragraph, you know, I describe the first time that I had a real sense of, of stillness and quiet in my mind and, and how, and, and I, I often talk about this and I was actually talking about this with Dan Harris on 10% Happier and, and he, you know, wasn't really well ready to accept my conclusion, which I will tell you, uh, but I had this experience. It was I was on a three week retreat, so my first sort of longer retreat, and kind of struggling day by day and sitting by sitting, and then uh, in the middle of the afternoon one day, it just it sort of like something popped, you know, and I just f dropped into. All of a sudden, it was like, oh, right, okay, this is it. Not, you know, and, and it wasn't enlightenment. It was just, oh, this is sort of meditating. <laughs> like everything I've been doing has been sort of like imitating meditating. So probably a, a lot of you know what I mean by that. Like you sit down and you're like, okay, I'm sitting here. Okay, I'm closing my eyes. Now I'm going to pay attention to my breath. And you just sit and it's like, it doesn't seem like anything's happening, you know. <laughs> like, and you know, I'd been doing that for days. And, and I mean, I had various little moments, but this was like a real like whole body. Uh, and it is very body, you know, just kind of like dropping like, ah, oh, okay. And it wasn't even that my mind stopped. It was just that like, it didn't seem like my mind was a problem anymore, which I think is also sort of often misunderstood that, that I, I, I really think that when we say concentration, it's another word that's not the right word, but it's the best we have. That makes you think that your mind, that your attention is really focused on this one thing and you're concentrating on it. To me, it's actually my body that's concentrating. My mind is, you know, quieter and, and definitely comfortable, but my body is still, there's like a, an inner stillness that comes. And that's what kind of, arose that afternoon and um, for a long time I tried to like figure out how that happened and of course it happened because I was on a retreat for like at that point like 10 or 12 days you know okay but but what surprised me was that I had always thought that okay being on a retreat and meditating and trying to pay attention to your breath, what would happen is that I would gradually like really get focused on my breath and everything would just gradually, I'd finally get like, okay, I'm really, really focused. And, but instead what happened was I was just sitting there going, blah, 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 blah. 
Like, what just happened? So it didn't seem like I was paying it. I was focused on my breath a moment before. It was like somebody just turned off the radio. You know, that's that effect of like, oh, it's quiet now. Or the refrigerator stops humming, you know, like, oh. oh. So, so th this made me really reflect for years about effort. Because it seemed to me that what had happened wasn't directly in that moment related to the effort I was making to be present. But it certainly, I knew it was related to the fact that I'd been there and showing up and what was it that I'd been doing? And so this is where I come to my, you know, and many of you who have been hanging out with me for years have heard me say this before that what I think happens when the mind really gets quiet is that it's the accumulation of stillness and silence and um, time. So, I mean, that's accumulation, but it's sustaining stillness and silence for a long period of time, which is what we do on meditation retreats, just leads to a quieting that the form that we're using, whether it's paying attention to the breath or doing loving kindness or, you know, mantras or body scans, whatever you're doing, that I think is secondary. I think that you could be doing almost anything with the mind. If you do this with the body, the stillness, the silence, you know, and, the, and sustain it. Um, which again, I think goes along with what the Buddha is saying. He's, he's saying like, there isn't really a form. You can't just completely let go, but you can't like force it, you know, you can't just like, just pay attention to your breath. You know, that doesn't really make it happen. It's, you know, by not straining and not halting, I crossed the flood. I just kept showing up. You know, of course, it's, that's what recovery is about, you know. And, and it's, you know, the, the language of the 12 steps is trying to get at this from a different angle, from this theistic angle which is you aren't going to control it. You know, you don't have control over this. You're powerless. So you need to turn it over. Well, to me, our Dharma practice is turning it over to these elements, to stillness and silence and time. It's trusting in that process. And yeah, and we have a form whether, you know, as I say, breath or whatever you're working with, but we're, we're not, we're not running the show. I mean, how many times have you sat down to meditate and every, you thought you were doing everything right. And 20 seconds later, you're gone. You're like, Oh, let me come back. And then 10 seconds later, you're gone. And then you can't even come back. You're like, it's like, what, wait, you know, you know, and then there are times when, Oh, Oh, I'm getting it now. It's like, oh, okay, well, maybe, you know. Um, and so, so for me, uh, that's also freeing because I'm not like, uh, you know, and I was talking a little bit about this, I think during the guided meditation, I'm not judging my effort all the time. Like, am I doing enough right now? Am I doing it right? Am I trying hard enough? Should I pay, be paying attention to my belly instead of my nostrils? Or, you know, should I be doing more loving kind? You know, we get into this like doing mode as though my doing and my will is what's going to make this happen rather than saying, oh, there's a process here. It's showing up, engaging, and then letting go of the results, you know, um, and that, no matter what, that makes your meditation more pleasant. You know, I, I don't know if it's the, the way to cross the flood or, you know, um, you know, if it's the way to get enlightened, but it's, you know, it takes it out of this struggle, you know.
know, the idea that, oh, I'm going to learn to meditate, which sounds like a really nice thing to do. Like, oh yeah, that's going to be relaxing. You know, that'll be, you know, that'll be good for me, you know, because I'm striving too much or I'm too stressed or whatever. And then you sit down to meditate and you turn it into another project of trying to get it right. And well, uh, I need to read another book, figure out how, you know, what am I doing wrong? You know, well, uh, that's like, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, that's like, why do we do that to ourselves? You know, but we do, you know, and maybe it's our culture, but I think it's, I think it's sort of human nature too. So, um, so the, um, I'll read a little bit more and, and I might let's see what the time is. Yeah. So I say, this is the paradox. Nothing happens if we don't work for it. And yet our work alone doesn't make it happen. The reason for this paradox is that if we strive too hard for quiet or peace, the striving itself creates disruptive energy that blocks the arising of that quiet. Just as the Buddha says, if we strain, then we get swept away. Or as the third Zen patriarch put it, if you try to stop activity to achieve passivity, your very effort fills you with activity. Oh my goodness, for some reason. Adobe wants me to like update my, what the hell? Really? Thanks Adobe, interrupting my Dharma talk. Uh, however, if we do nothing, make no effort, how are we going to develop any of these qualities? The art of meditation is learning to make the fullest effort possible without straining or expecting any results. This balance between striving and letting go is the quote, vigilant surrender, unquote, that allows peace to appear. Vigilant surrender, uh, that comes from a, an Advaita teacher, um, which is, you know, it's a, it's a good phrase too, because it, again, kind of captures the, this paradox, is surrendering, but with vigilance, like, you know. So we don't just let go and like, oh, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I thought, I thought um, for those who have been watching this or coming to this for a while, the, the red painting that used to be behind me, and maybe I'll put it back up, is actually um, a couple of the paragraphs of the... Uh, verses of the faith mind that I quoted there from the third Zen patriarch. And I thought I would read a little bit of this. Um, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When love and hate are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. If you wish to see the truth, then hold no opinions for or against anything. To set up what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. When the deep meaning of things is not understood, the mind's essential peace is disturbed to no avail. To set up what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. And so again, this is more about the idea of, of a balanced mind state. It's not so much about effort, but you know, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. It's when we have this idea that, oh, I'm supposed to have this experience with meditation, you know, then all of a sudden it becomes difficult, you know? And, and of course, you know, just to say like, this is perhaps an impossible thing to attain, to have no preferences, you know, but 
it's really helpful to just like see that and realize, wow, you know, it's my wanting things to be different from the way they are that's really causing the problems. When love and hate are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Yeah. Which is, you know, um, the third noble truth, you know, the truth of suffering, the first noble truth, second noble truth is the truth of clinging and clinging to, you know, preferences is what causes suffering. And then when we let go of that clinging, when love and hate are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. <sighs> Painful. Uh, so um, maybe I'll open it up for any questions or comments. Anybody has anything to say this evening? You're welcome to just, I mean, you can raise your hand in the, in the, uh, oh, Jeff, go ahead. That was actually a raised hand. Hi. A raised hand. Hey, I have a, a quick question um, <laughs> about what Dan Harris disagreed with you in your conclusion. <laughs> what was it that he struggled um, reckoning with in the conclusion? Because that, that, um, the form that we were using, that that even our maybe even our striving, I, I'd have to listen to it again. But I remember in that moment he was like kind of skeptical of my conclusion that really what makes our mind calm down is sitting still and being silent and sustaining that. That it really that what else we do, that whether you know however else we apply our attention, isn't really that important. And he was like, oh, wow. which, you know, it, I've never heard anybody else put it that way. I've never heard any other teachers say it. So I'm always a little skeptical when I come up with some idea that <laughs> nobody else is validating. Uh, but uh, it's fun. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's very difficult, of course, to prove. Um, Right. But but I think it's a question, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's it was out of that experience and then many, many more experiences. And, and a lot of you, including you, have been on retreats and have probably had some experiences like that. Right. Like, wait a minute. It's quiet now. Where did that come from? Did you ever have that experience? Yeah, for sure. Um, how do you how do you quantify the experience or how do you figure out what thing brought you there yeah right and because you want to know right wait what's the what was the magic potion there that made that happen like you know let me see now what did i have for lunch you know <laughs> and how long was that walk i took after lunch because right after that then i had this great meditation yeah and, and we're kind of looking for some kind of, uh, you know, formula, but, but especially I think people look for a kind of the, an effort or a form of meditation practice that is the one that really works. You know, this one works, you know, like, hey, uh, and it's, again, we're, we're very materialistic in that way, you know, trying to, it's like, uh, oh my faith my this is the best meditation app you know <laughs> uh, it's the one that gets me really okay all right great you know <laughs> i'm glad that works for you but it's probably going to wear off at some point Thank you. yeah thanks thanks for asking i have to say i don't remember where i heard this um, you had mentioned one time um, how sometimes if you just sit and be still, it'll come to you. Um, 
which I have to do sometimes with kids running all over my house. But um, I've been trying to do that as a practice as well. It's just sit and sometimes it'll just happen. Yeah. So I just wanted to tell you I took um, that seriously. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it kind of works for me when I when I need it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I make it complicated, you know. And, and, and again, I, I do think that, I mean, I mean, it's great to have techniques are useful, you know, that there's, you know, it's great to be like, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll do this. And it'll kind of help me to get going, but they're not magic. You know, that's the thing. I mean, I, I, my first meditation practice was TM where you repeat a mantra and it's the mantra is in Sanskrit and they never tell you what it means. So of course I'm like, oh, this is like magic. And it's gonna like do something because they told me like, if I, if I do it long enough, I'll experience cosmic consciousness, whatever the hell that is. But hey, it sounds good to a drug addict. You know, I wanna get some of that cosmic consciousness, man. And you know, it's just a mantra. It's just a, I mean, my first Buddhist teacher said, oh, you can use anything as a mantra. You could just use Coca-Cola. That would be fine. <laughs> you know, I was like, wait, wait. It's, I thought the words were magic. No, I think really. Larry David said that too. Oh, really? <laughs> On an episode. Oh. Yeah. He was like, that's my mantra. You can't take mine. That's my <laughs> right. personal one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Well, and by the way, like there was a, a magazine article back in the early 80s that revealed that although when you when you paid for your tm mantra and they told you it was specially like designed for you they were actually assigned by age so if you were between 21 and 25 or something they gave you a certain one if you're 25 to 30 you give it a different one and they they were not like you know oh kevin your personality you know i'm reading your tea leaves and your horoscope and you are here's your mantra no it's like how old are you oh yeah okay here take this um did i see gail had her hand up hi kevin hi. I, I i really appreciated what you were saying and the amazing thing is i kept shaking my head that <laughs> i'd had that experience yet i'm a novice i'm a newcomer uh-huh. i haven't been meditating that long um, I've only been on one relatively long retreat, and that was with you last fall. Mm-hmm. And I've been on several by myself, but I had that experience just sitting right where I am. Yeah. And I remember going to the meeting the next morning, an AA meeting, and I described it as the voices in my head went quiet. Mm-hmm. That, that's just kind of how I, and, and I remember, I mean, this wasn't that long ago, and I was on Zoom, and so I could see everybody in the room, and I could tell that nobody related to what I said. <laughs> <laughs> there was like no reaction. Oh God! <laughs> and um, <laughs> but I remember I my my therapist, who is a who is a Buddhist, who sort of in into um, you know, this type of meditation. He sort of got headed me this direction. I remember talking to him the following day, saying, you know, I'm not going to chase it that I had heard, I had learned from other experiences that they aren't, you don't repeat them. I won't yeah. repeat them. It'll never quite be the same. Yeah. And so I don't know what it was, but I was just sitting where I am now, just doing one more of, I'm in a 90 day commit to sit program. So I sit every morning by myself and then I sit with some group every day. Right. So I'm not just, and so I'm saying you attribute this to a long, you know, uh, uh, extended um, retreat, mm-hmm. and I'm and I'm just questioning that. Well, oh, oh uh, good, good. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you're right. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, first of all, of course you're right because you experienced it. So that's, um, yeah. Uh, where does it come from? I mean, I think one of the reasons it took me a long time to get there was because. I was still an active addict, an alcoholic, and you know my own proclivities are, you know, te- I tend not to get calm easily. But I want to say two things. One, first of all, um, yeah, the, it's not that predictable. It's just that 
you increase the likelihood you know it's it's you know when you sustain it you know then you kind of when you sustain the stillness and quiet you increase the likelihood of it arising right the but it's true that we can always we can always have those moments because there it's just it's just our mind you know and our mind is capable of going there so there's no reason it can't go there just more easily and it's really i really appreciate that you had the wisdom to say i'm not going to try to like recreate that or like go back and get that and i would suggest that you when you have uh, now i'm going to contradict myself a little bit when you do have an experience like that to see if you can not like try to recreate it but kind of se- see if you can feel like kind of what the trigger, if there's an internal trigger, like there, and it, it's maybe it's the opposite of a trigger. I don't know what that would be, but the release, the internal kind of like, Oh, Oh, I let go of that, you know, and, and you can kind of, and you can kind of glance inside yourself and see if, you know, when you're meditating, kind of go, oh, let me see if that's available right now. And you kind of turn toward it. You don't grasp it. You don't try to make it happen, but you kind of go, oh, let me just breathe. And, and it might open and it, you might kind of, you, you might find that you develop like that sometimes you can kind of go there and it might not, but as long as you're not grasping, it won't be a problem, right? If it's like, Oh, I want to make this happen rather, but if you just kind of go, Oh, let me see if I can kind of just drop in there. I did think about, you know, was there, you know, what was the circumstances and it, it, um, you know, I don't know that we're even talking about the same thing, but I think maybe, but I I can't, I can't say that, you know, that we are, but um, it was that it was one of those cases where I had, I had stopped struggling totally what you were saying today yeah. I, I you know because i'm i'm a newcomer so it's a constant struggle and i can't do it perfect you know but i remember your line in, in one of your first books it's something to the effect of you know that i it, my my mind's too smart or whatever and then you said mm-hmm. in the line in your book was which what what does that make me too dumb <laughs> right you know, right. I don't know which book that was. Yeah, that's Burning Desire, right? Yeah, yeah. it really struck me that, yeah. uh, that when you said that. So, not to, not in other words, don't judge myself. Yeah, Period. that's what that means. Yeah, that gets yeah, good advice. <laughs> judging ourselves, and I again, it's like this idea of judging our meditation. Like, well, whoever thought we <laughs> that was a good idea, you know why? And it, and it is sort of the way we, in our culture, we turn everything into striving and, you know, acquisition and doing it right and all of that. But, uh, you know, it sounds like you're, you know, you found a nice, some nice uh, just ways of being in your practice. And it's, it's only happened once. <laughs> well, yeah, but. You know that's, you know that's uh, the those neural pathways are kind of are there. It's there. You know you can tap into it. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I get a lot of value out of knowing that because I have had that experience, it exists. Right. Period. Uh, uh, oh, that's that's a really good point, Gail. Uh, um, because that reinforces our faith and our confidence that this this works and and we understand it's not always going to happen but that we we do have that potential and, and certainly you know i that very much sustains my own practice um and you know and it, there's a way i mean I, you know in which we can you know, we can take three breaths and just have a quiet moment. You know what I mean? Just like, you know, in the middle of the day, just stop. And it's not that like, 
you know, I'm going to have and, and kind of keep getting kind of develop my familiarity with that, with that feeling and with that mind state of just being quiet, even for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we're, we're getting after, after eight o'clock. Um, oh, I see Lorinda has her hand up in the uh, virtual sense. So I will pass it to her as our last um, question. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm kind of the opposite of Gail, I think. I more, I've had many years of Zen practice. Um, I've been practicing for 35 years or so through mostly the Berkeley Zen Center, but I've moved oh. up here to Sonoma County, so I'm finding places here to do it, but I'm very new to sobriety. Um, and I'm in, within my first year and um, I haven't been able to maintain it completely. And I couldn't, your, I found your talk kind of abstract and uh -huh. I couldn't kind of relate it to the steps or to uh, the sobriety that yeah. I'm seeking. Yeah. Um, so I just wondered if you could say anything about yeah, that. Yeah, thank, thank you for letting me know that. Um, because certainly, you know, this is kind of like a year long conversation that's been going on here. <laughs> and, and sometimes it gets deep into the, the Dharma end of it, and loses a little bit of the, the um, clear connection to recovery. So, so uh, to go back to the step. So, as I said, we were in step seven. So step seven says we humbly asked him, God to remove our shortcomings. And, you know, thus the section of the, of the chapter I was reading is humbly humbled. So, so I kind of, the book kind of goes back and forth between trying to sort of make points about recovery and then tying it to, to meditation or Buddhism, but then also going all the way over to just talking about meditation because the book was written with the intention especially of helping people who were in 12-step programs learn to meditate and get comfortable with meditation. So some of the sections are just like about meditation. Um, but the point about effort is very much like a recovery concept that, you know, if we try to suppress our craving, if we, you know, if we try to force, you know, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, you know, <laughs> kind of, it just creates more internal tension that at some point just snaps. And then we go off, you know, and, and so that, so that the not straining, but not standing still is very much kind of that balance of like trying to really stay with it one day at a time, showing up, doing the best we can, letting go. And so, so there's that connection, I think, with recovery. And, and, um, but, but the, you know, perhaps the hardest thing for us is simply to have a craving and, and hold that craving without acting on it. And, and our practice helps us with that too, because I mean, when you sit down to meditate, you're not doing anything, no matter what shows up in your mind, <laughs> you know, you're not stopping and going, yeah, I'm going to go call that person and yell at them. And like, because you, the resentment that comes up or, you know, uh, and so um, I think our meditation practice can be a kind of training ground for holding the cravings that arise. Although primarily, I, I think I think it's really really hard to resist craving. So I think primarily our our need is to avoid letting the craving arise at all, and that's where the program, whatever program you're working, and 
as well as meditation and our spiritual practice and our community, all of those things and our therapist, you know, all, all the things that we depend on really, to me, keep me from getting to the point where there is a craving, you know, where it's like, oh, shit, I really want to drink. Like, you know, if, and so all that sort of self care is really the foundation for avoiding relapse. And, and again, for me, and it sounds like you've got an extensive practice, our practice really supports that because our practice, meditation has the effect of cooling the passions, right? Cooling any kind of, you know, uh, craving energy and I don't, I don't just even mean craving for alcohol but just that like that feeling like I've got to fix things things have to be different you know our practice really helps us just to to get quiet and to be like oh I'm okay just the way I am things aren't perfect but I can be here so so for, to me that's like a really foundational aspect of my recovery and and again why I kind of wrote one breath at a time because I saw so many people who didn't have that, who, who they stayed sober and they worked a program and they, they were okay, but they never really found the peace that I think, you know, recovery is promises and the steps kind of promise. Uh, and, and to me, that's mostly because they ha didn't really develop the meditative side of their recovery. You said something um, months or so ago at Spirit Rock, you were talking about meditation as well. And I had kind of forgotten the concept of refuge, yeah. to take refuge yeah. in the Dharma. But um, I don't know, you know, just one of those things, I'd forgotten the word and the word became, after you said it, very important to me. Um, and it's helped me, the meditation has really helped me in finding refuge. Yeah. Yeah. From all the, tumult, the tumultuous year and what's yeah. in my own, own brain and the news and the whole yeah. thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the idea of refuge to me, refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, is that I remember what's really important. And I remember what's really true. You know? And, and I guess I remember how to take care of myself, you know, and to do that. Um, and, and as you say, that it gets me out of all that, like st all the input as well as my own output <laughs> into the, into that, you know, and just like, Oh, what's really, what's really important. Like I'm worrying about this and I'm upset about that. And I'm angry about, Oh, well, what really matters to me? Well, what really matters to me is, kindness, awareness, you know, um, peace, the love, you know. And so uh, before I go, I want to mention, somebody asked about the uh, book I was reading, uh, the Sutta book. And that is the, I'm going to put it in the uh, chat. It's the Samyutta. Nikaya, which means the connected discourses. So um, it it takes some work uh, to uh, to understand it, but yeah, that's for you, Cheryl. <laughs> so um, thank you all for hanging out on a Friday night. Don't drink or use, no matter what. <laughs> Meditate. And uh, I'll see you all uh, if I don't see you tomorrow. Uh, that is by, yes, that's Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, sorry, somebody asked me the, about uh, Samyutta Nikaya. It's, he's the translator, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, now, let me try to end again. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Everybody peaceful. Be well. Thank you. Stay safe. <laughs>